People have slags and toxins, but there are also mental toxins. Any thought you have is toxic in one way or another. If your mind roams in one place and your body dwells in another, you waste energy and grow old. You are fully engaged in the process. Why engage if we're not fully committed? It would be just a waste of time. It's better to play tennis or go out with friends. Just live a life you want to live. Good afternoon, Imram. We have a few questions today, but all of them are important. They deal with the correct usage of a rosary, personality traits, and concentration. Master, may I ask you to charge my rosary? Do you think I'll give it back to you? Look, you asking me to do that suggests that you don't believe in your own nature. You think that I should charge your rosary, right? I don't mind doing it, and the rosary will retain a portion of my energy, but why don't you believe in your own nature? Why do you think that if I charge your rosary with my energy, it will work and do what is to be done by you? You mentioned that a rosary is not to be touched. How do I use a rosary for meditation? You just want me to dwell on the example I've provided. The case is that a rosary is a symbol of the Divine. Each bead is the name of God, and each name of God is sacred. So when you wear Japamala beads that are known as a rosary, you need to understand that every time you practice, they are magnetized and retain the spiritual energy, the spiritual power. When you put them on afterwards, that energy stays with you. For every time you recite a name for each bead, that name begins to vibrate in that bead, since there is a law of connection. If you pass the rosary to someone, you are giving that energy to that person. It might be the right thing to do, but that person may not realize what you have done for them, and the energy will merely dissipate. It is therefore believed that a rosary, japa mala beads, should not be given to anyone. But I notice that people carry rosaries around sometimes when they sit down, rosaries touch the floor or other objects. All this discharges its energy. To address the matter of spiritual magic seriously, you should realize that these artifacts you've been praying for for years can dissipate in five minutes. Simply because you treat rosaries as fashion jewelry. It's cool to wear, we are hip, as they call it. Those who practice regularly either hide the rosaries under their clothes or carry it in a pouch, like Vaishnavas do. There are also other options. Some don't carry their rosary around and work with it only at home. They leave it home when they go out. If it's not the way you'd like to follow, you can choose any type of rosary, for example, like this. You can pray on it so intensely that it will vibrate and even heal when necessary. But on a large scale, you don't need it now. You need a rosary to count your breaths. I'll repeat, if you want to use it for japa meditation, your rosary must be only yours. You mustn't give it to other people. Touch others with it or use it so as to make it dirty, when you sit on the floor, for example. It's your attitude. By and large, it makes no difference for God, but it makes a difference for you, because it's your attitude. When you step on the mat you have just prayed on, you demonstrate your attitude towards God through this mat, through this place. Do you understand?
It's about attunement. It's your proper attitude. You might have noticed that before a Zen monk sits down to meditate, he makes a lot of smooth, proper movements. He puts his shoes down before the place of prayer, the altar or the wall he is looking at, with great concentration. The way he folds his clothes, every action is perfected. He folds them. He doesn't just toss them off. It's a sign of a lack of inner discipline. When a person clears the table like this, so that everything spills over, crumbs fall down, etc., this shows that their mind is chaotic. They need to start working on themselves. There are people who seem to be willing to do something, but are bound to break or spill something. One of my friends was just like that. It's Ahmed. I ask him, please don't touch anything, I'll do everything myself. He replies, come on, it's fine. He does it and it's all over you, on the floor, everywhere. So much for clearing the table. Everything is messed up, everything is spilled, etc. He is just a rough person, he doesn't understand what he is doing. It seems okay to him. What if we deal with subtle things that make up your universe? Such a gesture would overthrow your universe. Global processes may look just like these. Do you understand? These are inner states. That's why, when you practice, try to avoid unnecessary movements, including tongue movements. I remember when after two practices I said, now I recommend you not to talk. They come up and say, let's do mauna, let's be silent. I simply asked for 20 to 30 minutes of silence after the practice. What do you think happened? It's not a reproach, but we are doing a spiritual practice. We are trying to change our lives for the better. Therefore, make sure that you are very conscious of your actions. Like a Japanese woman before a tea ceremony, her every step is perfected. She sits down, it would seem nothing special, open the door, crawl in and crawl out. They have to crawl through a low door to enter the room. But she sits down, stays in that posture for a second, and turns around. Puts her hands, turns around, opens the door, makes a step, turns around, shuts the door, turns around, stands up, turns, and goes. Just imagine how many movements. It's all about practice. If you are conscious while acting, these actions nourish you. If your mind roams in one place and your body dwells in another, you waste energy and grow old. Unfortunately, this is true. Moreover, every thought is toxic. Thoughts are toxic by their nature. People have slags and toxins in their bodies, but there are also mental toxins. Any thought you have is toxic in one way or another. Some thoughts are very toxic, these are filthy thoughts. Then there are merely toxic thoughts, which are less evil than the ones I've already mentioned. But nonetheless, they are harmful, at least because they are in the past. Any thought is derived from the past. A product left for 24 hours becomes tamasic, right? Food that was left overnight carries some sort of energy. This energy is tamasic. Overnight meal is unhealthy. In Ayurveda, Khadija will talk about it. Meal is supposed to be freshly cooked. Overnight meal is already tamas. An overnight thought, roughly speaking, a thought from the past. With thoughts, everything happens quickly. One second, two seconds late, and it's already tamasic. This is why it's toxic, even if it's very important to you. All the same, it belongs to the past. Thoughts will arise mechanically in the mind, take away our energy, vitality, and poison the brain. It has been proven by modern progressive scholars, so it's not only my opinion. This is why Goraknath asked how not to think that he needs to avoid thinking. How do we avoid thinking about how not to think? You know it all.
If a person gives their rosary they have prayed on, can it be further used? Once you take a rosary in your hands, look, you buy a rosary that has already been in the hands of 10 to 20 different people who don't need a rosary but need money to be paid for this rosary. It's made of stone, wood, etc. You buy it, does it matter from whom? And it carries energy and information of those people who carved these stones and so on. These people may be drinking, they may be swearing, it doesn't matter. This information is contained here. However, when you start working with it, when you start reciting the name, all this high-frequency information displaces old data and purifies the rosary of its previous connections. You start working with it, its past doesn't matter. By working with it, you gain power because you practice. It helps you practice, and the same very power transforms and purifies it. But once you've taken it and started working with it, it's no longer advisable to give it to someone else. But if you give it, you should know that you'll have to start all over again. The same happens when you say a mantra out loud. It can lose its power. Therefore, personal mantras given by a guru should not be recited in public. A rosary contains a mantra too in the stones. Here a mantra is present at an informational level. People recite it. Now, how do we recite it? Do you know how the Vedic tradition prescribes to hold the rosary? The index finger doesn't touch it. Hold the rosary over your middle finger and rotate it with your thumb. Hold the index finger apart. This is a Vedic tradition. The rest of people do it like this. They use their index finger and thumb. May one use the same rosary for multiple mantras. Multiple mantras can be recited in the same rosary. However, different mantras will not help you reach the desired result. You should need to make up your mind and shouldn't use many mantras. It's better to choose one mantra and work with it till you reach your goal. Some people get a personal mantra from a guru. As a rule, it's not long, because they recite it all the time. Then there are mantras you recite either in the morning or during the day, or in the evening. For example, Gayatri Mantra or Sai Gayatri Mantra requires a lot of attention and should be recited 108 or 1008 times, depending on your goal. Or Mahamriti Jaya Mantra. However, you recite the mantra that a guru gave you all the time within, and you can use any type of rosary for it. Which hand do you hold the rosary in? The right one, near your heart. It's correct to hold it at the level of the heart center. When the great sages, rishis, sit and pray, the rosary, their focus, is right here, on the heart, on the rosary. They read their minds as they focus on the hearts. You can hold it in your left hand too, or in your right hand. There are special stands available. Have you seen them? Have you seen the portraits of sages, or witnessed rishis reading homilies? They have a tea stand to support their right elbow, so that they don't get tired when they recite. How do you become humble? It's simple. You have a spine. This is an altar. The lower part of the spine is responsible for immodesty. The middle part of the spine is responsible for a neutral state between humility and spirituality. The part just above that is responsible for neutrality, stability, and a humble state where all immodest manifestations are ignored. Even higher is the state where you are completely beyond your ego. You are no longer your ego. This is Vishuddha. And Ajna, that's dissolving. Sahasrara is dissolving too. But Ajna is already understanding of God's laws. As we live our ordinary life, all our attention, our energy, our consciousness are concentrated on Muladhara, Svadhisthana and Manipura. The most immodest chakra is the Manipura chakra. Look how handsome I am. It's about ambitions. It's about aggression. 
The Muladhara Chakra is the base. The Muladhara Chakra has its programs, Sadhisthana has its programs, Manipura has its programs too. Altogether they form the lower centers where the human ego is concentrated. All of the above issues are there. As we focus our attention here, becoming aware of the high world, becoming aware of the high nature, we allow the energy of the Spirit, the transcendental power, to descend downwards from above, and it neutralizes everything. One becomes humble and spiritual without any effort. They don't need to be told about being honest because they are honest. It comes from within, just like a fish swimming in water doesn't know what water is. Do you remember? It's natural for a fish, it's natural for you. You do not need to create conditions in which you'd intentionally be honest. You are like that, and that's it. Why? Because if you focus on the lower part and start training your kundalini, as they do in many schools, please be prepared that in this muladhara, in this vadistana, all the qualities of these chakras, and there are a lot of them mixed up in there, will immediately manifest and scatter in every direction like cockroaches. And each cockroach is like a nuclear explosion. You'll have to timely catch them by tail or legs, otherwise they will scatter scary fast. This is what your psycho-emotional state will be like. A fireworks of inappropriate social reactions begins then. An ambulance arrives straight away, they get you in a straitjacket and goodbye. Just because a person behaves strangely in the society. Why? Because they twitch their kundalini mechanically, break it through, while being unprepared. And it goes wild. It becomes uncontrollable. A master may have gone through this. His master controlled his kundalini. And the master is supposed to control kundalini that awakens in his disciple. But a master may have many disciples. Imagine that he is in India, and his disciple with awakening kundalini is near Moscow. It's hard to control it. These kinds of systems helping achieve good results is nothing but talk. They are just dreams and ideas. This is why Sri Aurobindo said in his time, the supramental is the key. Babaji taught us Kriya Yoga. Why? Because with the downward flow of high spiritual power that is in control of everything, we can transform these chakras by bringing in this spirit energy, by allowing this to happen. The principle is to flush out negativity with positivity. How does one fill a bottle of water? They pour water from the top. We do not fill a bottle with water from the bottom, as the water goes down. There is that dirty water in Muladhara and Svadhisthana, enough for the three lower chakras. This water pours down in a powerful stream and washes out that dirt. The bottle overflows, the water pours out. Eventually only pure water is left inside. That's it. In that sense, you realized the principle of washing a barrel out. Don't worry about it. Just practice without any hassle. If you are tired, have a break. If you have annoying thoughts, you know what to do. If you can't manage to do that as your mind gets tired sometimes, get out of that state, walk around for a while, breathe, sit down again if you have time. If not, do it later. It is often hard to concentrate simply because the surrounding space is not suitable for practice. We are dependent on all this. Therefore, you should find a corner where no one has set their foot. I notice some people, when practicing at home, sit on a mat. When they finish, they begin to buzz about. They receive calls, do this, do that. They are already in a completely social, sometimes chaotic state. 
They put on a pair of trainers ready to leave, and then they realize they've forgotten something in the room. And they walk across the mat to pick up what they need before leaving. The mat lies on one side, the trainers on the other. Roughly speaking, this is chaos. It's unacceptable. Because this is a sacred space. This small corner is your sacred space. Have you ever seen me leaving my mat as it is after practicing? I fold it as if it's the most precious thing for me. I do it to show you how it should be. However, on a large scale, I don't depend on the mat. But the place where you practice must be taken great care of, if possible. How do I treat thoughts that rush in and prevent me from concentrating? Do we witness them consciously? This is how I interpret what you've said. You want to keep focused. You want to practice successfully. It's an important question. But at the same time, you feel that power is lost. Concentration is lost. The focus is not as sharp as it should be, because the energy is dissipated. There are two forms of attachment. Attachment to the outer world that takes you away from practice. This is your major attachment. And the second type is an immense concentration that is based on the attachment to the spiritual practice and attachment to the achievement through the spiritual practice. The second type is better. However, if a spiritual practitioner doesn't finally cope with their attachment to gaining superpowers, they encounter another problem. They may be immensely concentrated, but this concentration is driven by their ego. They want to achieve their goals fast. Sometime later they will get tired because their minds will tell them, I've been practicing for three days already and haven't reached Samadhi yet. When will I reach Samadhi? And the practitioner will simply say, I don't want it anymore. And what is left? An understanding of what is really important. And what's important is not to expend more than 50% of your overall power on achieving concentration. For example, you can put all your effort in achieving concentration, but it won't last long, as your mind will get tired. At the initial stage, 50% or even 30 to 40% will be enough. When concentrating, you train your mind not to wander off because you are interested. You have a desire to reach your goal. You practice with interest. You personally have a great interest in practicing. I understand that you ask it for other people to know, but I also understand that it's also true for you. When you sit down, you really want to practice and you do it, but soon there comes a moment when your mind gets tired. What's most interesting is that when the mind is tired, one wants to sleep. But the moment our mind gets tired, we remember that coffee shop, Surf, sells gluten-free sweets, and we are immediately filled with energy. Where does this energy come from? The problem is in the mind. The problem is, once we are very tired and don't feel like practicing, we go to bed and say, I need to have a rest tonight. Every time at 2 a.m. I hear, get some sleep, because people know I get up early and practice. I have only several hours of sleep. So they go, you need to get some sleep, and I respond, yes, I am tired. It would seem, however, I realize when I get home, I will do other things. Why am I able to do this? Because I am motivated. I have no right to be tired because you are there. I need to settle it since I am committed to your development. It's not just about being committed, it's about being human. I have no right to deceive you. So what is my motivation in this situation? Unwillingness to deceive you, unwillingness to fail in some way to give you what I want. Today, you have at least the following motivation. Unwillingness to deceive me. 
This is the first thing. And the second, unwillingness to deceive yourself. Why engage if we're not fully committed? It would just be a waste of time. It's better to play tennis or go out with friends, just live a life you want to live. But as you have made up your mind, my answer is for him, but it's relevant to everyone. As you have made a decision, you have to follow this path. And what's most important, not to let yourself down. Because if you live an ordinary life, you let yourself down very much. Unfortunately, this is true. What motivation can one find in this case? At least a willingness to gain creative powers, or even superpowers. Even though this is not the purpose of yoga, we don't need superpowers for the sake of having them. Our goals are bigger. We have one great goal, which is much more spiritual. And from the perspective of the spirit, it looks much more sublime. However, for an average person, first and foremost, we want to be immune to death and any illness, and be cooler than everyone else. This is how ego works, and that's okay. The principle of competition. The principle that could be expressed like this, I'll practice Kriya for some time, I'll reach a very high level in a short while. Maybe I'll even reach Samadhi, and everyone will know what sort of person I am. I don't refer to all of you. However, this is the initial stage of becoming selfish. It's okay, it motivates us to practice. When one is on this path, their ego will get subtler. They will realize that the purpose of their practice is not to show off, but to awaken certain qualities that would help them in life. You see, the ego is still there, but it becomes subtler. I have awakened qualities that I can already make good use of, and I'm happy to be able to help people. And I'm happy to be thanked by them. It feels good. It feels cool. It's good to be known about, to be spoken about, to be respected. To some extent, the ego gets bigger. You are respected, you can help people, people help you. In this way, good, positive social interactions are established, but they are also driven by ego. You go on practicing and say, well, I don't really need anything, I'm just happy to be able to help. This is why I keep practicing. I practice and I do want to help others. And people of the previous stage ask, what do you want to get through this? I don't know. You are weird, why do you waste your effort then? Look at me, I practice, I'm a good psychologist or kinesiologist, people know about me. I have established a center, I have employees, I have this, I have, I, I, I. And a practitioner of a higher level says, you are doing great, but I've already gone through this, I don't need it now. All of this lies ahead of you. You should understand, what you put in your practice now will become a foundation for you. It will be your starting point to move on. The foundation will be here, but the walls, ceiling, roof, and so on will be somewhat different in general. When you see a beautiful house, you aren't aware of its deteriorating foundation. The house looks beautiful. We need a really good foundation that would hold a building safe and comfortable for people to be in. They would say that the construction guys did a good job. I'm talking about your inner building, your inner development. When you have a motivation, or you are still at the first stage and want to get superpowers through practice, you are attuned, you have an immense desire, and desire attracts energy. This energy helps you tune, and once tuned, you won't be distracted, you enter the flow. Okay, another example. Remember when you were a kid, you were really interested in something and immersed in it without paying attention to anything else. You wouldn't even hear your parents or friends calling you. You were fully engaged in the process. You were in the flow state. Then you switched on somehow. Has anyone experienced that? 
You are engaged in something very interesting, no one distracts you from writing or painting, but it turns out that people have been trying to reach out to you for half an hour. Well, not half an hour, maybe five minutes. Doesn't matter. And it seems strange to you. What happened? We've been calling you for ages, it's like you neither see nor hear us. I've been painting. For you it's a normal state, in which you don't need to exert yourself. When you paint and repeat, I won't let them distract me, I won't pay attention to them, I must paint, it's incorrect. Just be within it. People don't exist for you, or you don't exist for people. Just because you are in the creative state.